Good evening, everyone. Welcome to what's been a wonderful week here at the college with a CCA seminar. And now we cap it off with this final lecture by Victor Davis Hanson. My name is Mark Kultoff. I am the chairman of the history department here at Hillsdale College, where I'm a member of the faculty. And that gives me the privilege of introducing to you this evening's speaker. Victor Davis Hanson is the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow in Residence in Classics and Military History at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's Emeritus Professor of Classics at California State University, Fresno, where he founded the Classics Department. Most importantly this evening, he is also the Wayne and Marcia Busky Distinguished Fellow in History here at Hillsdale College. We're now for the last 15 years he has traveled to our campus to teach popular courses in military history and classical culture every September. Dr. Hansen earned his BA in Classics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He attended the American School of Classical Studies in Athens and earned the, his PhD in Classics from Stanford University. Among other awards, Dr. Hansen has awarded, been awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2007 and the Bradley Prize in 2008. He has written or edited 23 books, including The Other Greeks, The Family Farm and the Agrarian Roots of Western Civilization, The Soul of Battle, Who Killed Homer, The Demise of Classical Education and the Recovery of Greek Wisdom, Mexifornia, A State of Becoming, <laughs> which he he talks about the themes of that book regularly. I recommend it highly. Also, A War Like No Other, and most recently, his book, The Second World Wars. His 24th book, scheduled to appear early next year, will look at the presidency of Donald Trump. Beyond his many books, he is the author of hundreds of articles, book reviews, scholarly papers, and editorials covering diverse topics that range from ancient Greek culture, agrarian themes, and military history, to foreign affairs, domestic politics, and contemporary culture. These have appeared in almost every publication that matters, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, International Herald Tribune, New York Post, National Review, Washington Time, Washington Post, I could go on, many others. And he frequently appears in te on television and radio for NPR, PBS NewsHour, Fox News, CNN, and others. But beyond these many professional and scholarly achievements, Victor Hansen has become a dear friend of many. And we at Hillsdale have been especially blessed by his magnanimity, generosity, and kindness, even as we have benefited from and delighted by his quick mind his good humor, and his uncommon loyalty. Thank you, Victor. Please join me in welcoming our friend. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I wish it was a little less kind so I wouldn't have pressure not to disappoint you. But uh, <laughs> what I'd like to do is uh, put a context into the uh, Trump foreign policy because we can't really calibrate what's going on through the media or the opposition. I, I saw some adjectives and nouns today, chaos, disruption overseas. But to understand, I think, the Trump foreign policy, we should see how we got to where we are now and what were the conditions, both foreign and domestic, that created Donald Trump and created his foreign policy. We start with the so-called post-war order. That was the brilliant creation of American diplomats, Dean Acheson, George Kennan, George Marshall, Harry Truman, Eisenhower, after World War II. And remember what the, the rationale was, that we had, make, we had made a distinct mistake after World War I, that for a variety of reasons, we didn't stay engaged. We allowed the Imperial German Army to s surrender inside France and quickly came 
claim that that armistice was a de facto victory because they surrendered in somebody else's territory. We didn't follow the advice of John J. Pershing and General Folk to go in and occupy Germany as we did in World War II. So we were not going to do that again at the end of World War II. We also had an ambiguous relationship with the Soviet Union. We had felt that the Soviet Union in the 30s was imploding, that communism didn't work. The show trials, the purges of the military class, and especially the 20 million that died in the collectivization. So it was an odious creation, and yet more odious when it formed the non-aggression pact with Adolf Hitler on August 23, 1939. And then the inexplicable happened. We were still at peace and Germany invaded the Soviet Union, and we made a decision as early as October of 1941, we forget that, before Pearl Harbor, that under the newly passed Lend-Lease legislation, we began sending massive aid to the Soviet Union, even as we understood that was very dangerous to do, should it defeat the Third Reich, which we hoped it would, we would have a problem. And indeed, we did have a problem after the conclusion of World War II. We thought to ourselves, we're going to stay engaged, and it was a great thing that we destroyed the Third Reich and the Japanese Empire, but in the process of that, we've created another monster, and it's as godless and dangerous as the Third Reich, and it's Soviet global communism. And unfortunately, one of the tragedies of World War II is that the Soviet army is now not a thousand miles away from the English Channel, there is no uh, free and autonomous Eastern Europe. It was one of the great tragedies. We went to war for the freedom, suppose, we being the Allies, first Britain and then later France and then later us, but the concept was to keep Eastern Europe free, i.e. Poland from German aggression, and we ended up ensuring that it would not be free. And we moved the borders of the Soviet Union, not just to Germany, which had, there had been a buffer, now these communist satellite Warsaw Pacts were not just at the border of the, uh, the old German Empire, they're now in an interior border, right on the edge of what we call West Germany, and they were 350 miles from the English Channel, and they had 500 divisions. And our strategy of fighting World War II had been the great Soviet juggernaut who will kill two out of every three German soldiers will not have a navy, it will not have an air force, it will not have a U-boat uh, um, arm, it will not fight in Italy, it will not fight in North Africa, it will not fight Japan, but it will just stay there and like a bulldog destroy the German army. And it did, but again, the paradox was when the war was over, it was the biggest army in the world. We had 100 divisions in Europe and they had 500 and they were po poised to go right into the channel and they could any time want they wanted. So we said we're going to check Soviet power, both through a nuclear deterrent and we're going to fight, pay any price as John Kennedy, anywhere, anyhow, to stop this menace. And remember one of the reasons that we did it. We said that there is no other alternative. Japan is destroyed. It's not the Japan of today not the third largest economy, it's got a zero economy. And Germany is destroyed, it's not the fourth largest economy today, it's destroyed. And there is no Chinese miracle. Fifteen million people have died in China from Japanese occupation. It's not the second largest economy as it is today. And there is no EU. France has been occupied and nine other European countries, West and the East, Eastern Europeans. There's nobody but us in Great Britain, and Great Britain has decided to national their steel, nationalize their steel, their oil, their communications, their health, and, and they're not going to be in a position to take advantage of a world market at their feet. It was only us. If we didn't rebuild Europe, nobody else was. So we created these post-war institutions, the World Bank, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the United Nations. You remember NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Remember the motto of NATO, keep Russia out, General Ismay said, keep America in and keep Germany down. And that, that theory, that paradigm, that blueprint that we crafted, these brilliant diplomats, worked wonderfully for 45 years. And that, by that I mean the Chinese communists did not absorb all of Asia. They turned on 
the Soviets as we wanted. The Soviet Union did not take Europe. And we paid a terrible price for that. We spent between 4 and 5 percent GDP, and sometimes we peaked at 10 and 12 in Vietnam and Korea. We lost over 90,000 dead, more than the European theater of operations from Normandy to Germany in World War II in places like Korea and Vietnam. And we became the world's policemen. And it worked. So in 1989, 40, roughly 45 years, 44 years after it, this, this idea of a post-world order worked and it should have been done. We were done. We did what we wanted to do. And indeed, people said, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Berlin fall, Wall fell in 1989, the United States won the Cold War. Ronald Reagan's deterrent policies during the administration of his successor, George H.W. Bush. Germany was united, remember, against the objections of Margaret Thatcher. In 1990, it was united. Uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote his landmark, I guess it's a landmark book, I wouldn't necessarily agree, but in 1992, it was called The End of History. It took the theme that Hegel had remarked at the Battle of Jena in 1806 when Napoleon marched in, and he said basically, the old order is over with, the Napoleonic idea of a revolutionary society of equals will now be the paradigm that throughout Europe, history is over as we knew it. There's no other paradigm to what Napoleon ushered in. Fukuyama said, whether we like it or not, and we do like it, we won the Cold War, and there's no alternative to free market capitalism and constitutional government and freedom of the individual. And there's not going to be any more war. We won. And no sooner had he written that than the Balkans exploded. And as you remember, he was writing that just a year after the first Gulf War, in which we found out that Saddam Hussein might have gotten nuclear weapons, we don't know, but the Middle East was not stable, and they didn't think the, war, the end of history had come. Milosevic did not think the end of history had come. Noriega didn't think the end of history had come. And so the Iranians did not think with their hostage the end of history had come. So we had this post-war idea that, of containment and being the world's policeman that continued in to a new phase. And the conditions which created it no longer existed. There was no longer a Third Reich to defeat, and there was no longer a Soviet Union to contain. But we again felt we were now the hyperpower, the unipower. It was not a bipolar world, it was a unipolar. Nobody had as much strength as we did, and we were going to continue the success at great cost to us and expense because it was going to be much cheaper than the alternative, so we said. We were going to protect the free world. We didn't even use that word anymore because, of course, at the end of history, everybody was going to be free. But we were going to be the leader that so much, very similar to what Rome was. You classicists might remember that Edward Gibbon said, the greatest period of prosperity in the history of civilization was the hundred years starting with the emperor Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius, in which there was no war, there was no famine, and there were no contentious issues because all of mankind, 70 million people within a million square miles were all on the same page. And that was evoked again and again. That that's what we were after 1989 and 90. So we were going to be like Rome. And every once in a while, a Jugurtha or Mithridates or a Vercingetorix, some thug in Panama, as I said, or some thug like Saddam Hussein, or the they would sprout up and we would hit them down for the sake of the world. And this world order that it was still pretty much what it was after World War II. And all of these hallowed ins institutions, NATO, you and we would not question. And then we had 9-11. And 9-11 was strange, and the anniversary, of course, was yesterday, but the Japanese and the Germans and the Soviets had never taken down a, a high-rise you know, high right in the middle of Manhattan or killed 3,000 Americans. So this was a new threat, and we thought, well, the new war against terror will be operated in the same way we, we fought the Soviets. We'll still take on the burden, this responsibility, the burden of defense of the West against radical Islam. It's a illiberal doctrine. It threatens Western freedom. 
But what we didn't realize is due to our very success in the first phase of 45 years and the second one, and remember this second phase since 1989, we're still in, we're in the 30th year of it the fall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and we're still supposed to be the keeper of the values of the West to defeat the Soviet Union now it's transferred to these local thugs and radical Islam. But the problem is, did the world change? And were the premises of the post-war world order, were they still valid? And there were starting to be disturbing indications that while we still respected these institutions and we subsidized them and we intervened for the world order and we spent more than the next 19 military budgets in the world and we still lost Americans all over the globe, other people didn't think that we were doing this for them, or our enemies did not think the end of history was here. So we started to examine the last four or five years certain questions. I mean, they, they, were, they were not cut and dried issues. The new world order, the post-world world had assumed, remember, that democratization would put us in this end of history. So we had a country like China. We said to ourselves, there's a billion people, we need to bring it into the family of democratic nations. And according to people at the Hoover Institution where I work, the more affluence you have, the more you have a free market, even if it's a quasi-free market, the more liberalization inevitably follows. So we said to ourselves over the last 30 years, if they cheat, they being the Chinese on patents, it's okay. They're eventually gonna be wealthy and then they'll be democratic. If they cheat on copyright, they're wealthy, they'll be democratic. If they dump on the world market, it doesn't matter. If they run up a $350 billion surplus, it doesn't matter. If they go into the Spratly Islands and violate local uh, treaties with the Philippines or Vietnam, Japan, it doesn't matter because they're, going, they're getting wealthier and they're getting more like us. They wear suits and ties, they come to Silicon Valley, it doesn't matter. And all of a sudden we decided, I don't think they're, we said collectively, I don't think they're gonna become democratic. In fact, I think they're using free markets at the direction of the government to be the next Soviet Union. They're becoming more powerful than we are. And yet the status quo of the post-war order, the Council of Foreign Relations, the main think tanks, Brookings, American Enterprise Institute, Hoover Institution, the government department at Harvard, the council, and all these people said, no, 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 they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be democratic. They're going to eventually going to be one of us, and we have to take that hit. And remember also what the rationale of the post-war war order was, that since the rest of the world is flat and they're not, they don't have the wherewithal to be the global policeman and the global economic power and the global market for new, newly recovering countries to export and run up surpluses. We do. We do. We do. We heard that for 75 years. We're so powerful, we're so rich, we can do it. And we can take a $350 billion surplus with China. We, we're so rich. We looked at Europe. Well, Europe was not the same the last 10 years as it was. This EU, this European Union, we thought was going to be a common market, and then it was going to expand to sort of a common alliance. It was going to be an adjunct maybe of NATO. We didn't realize that this was some kind of Bonapartist utopian scheme, that they were going to outlaw war, they were going to open their borders to the people of the world, they were going to be leaders in climate change, they were going to disarm, they were going to have an act basically a democratic socialist paradigm, and we were going to defend them, and they were going to get very angry that we defended them. And we said to ourselves, it, we can do this. So if, if Germany has a $65 billion trade surplus with us, or during the, the uh, 2003 war, if the EU, all of the countries have damned us and they, France votes against us, it's okay, because this is the post-war order. That's what we're supposed to do. And then we said, Germany, is the most powerful country, it's got 80 million, it's, this, it's historically been dangerous, but we solved the problem because it's in the EU and it's in NATO. And people started to say, well, wait a minute, the last 10 years. The Pew, the Pew poll said that 
Germany polls of all countries in Europe the most anti-American. Under Obama, it was 53% of Germans like the United States. Today, it's 37%. It, Italians like Americans at twice the rate as Germans. And as I said, they're running at 65 billion, and they have dictated financial terms to the southern credit, uh, debtor nations, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. They have dictated immigration issues to Poland, Romania, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. They have dictated the conditions of Brexit to the UK, and they have told us we're spending 1.4% of our GDP on defense, and we're not going to go up and meet our promises at 2%. And we've said to them, if you don't invest 2%, how are we going to get the Belgians? And how are we going to get the Dutch? And how are we going to get the Norwegians to do it and meet their, because they follow your lead. And you're cutting a potentially large deal with Putin at $400 billion, and yet you want us to defend you from Putin? What's going on? This, doesn't, this isn't part of the post-war order. It, didn't, it wasn't supposed to work like that. And then we looked at Russia and we thought, at the end of communism, Yeltsin is, a, is one of us. We've sent off all of our Harvard economists over there. Russians are, are meeting us. They love us. They're going to make Harvard a Yale there. It's going to be a liberal democracy. It's got oil. And that didn't happen. It sort of became an autocratic, oligarchic, uh, you know, let's be, it's an orthodox country, it's deeply religious. It, it didn't seem the liberal country that we had counted on. We looked at the EU to take the entire EU and we said, wow, the demography is not even replacing its population, it's 1.4. Half of the churches are empty, it's a secular country. They have no means or ability or desire to assimilate, intermarry, or integrate Muslim immigrants. It, it seems foreign to us. But that's not supposed to be part of the post-war order. And the subtext of all this was, we can do it because we're the wealthiest country in the world. But under the tenets of globalization, which were, went hand in glove with American post-war leadership, people started to say, well, I'm starting to catch on to globalization. And that is, we take a big two, $365 billion hit with the Chinese, $65 billion with the Germans, $75 billion with the Mexican government, $75 billion, second only to Germany, excuse me, to China. It's bigger than the German. And we let three, 30 million, excuse me, $30 billion in remittances go back to Mexico, half of whom are being subsidized by the U.S. government, the people who send that money back. But we can do it. We're wealthy. We can be in NAFTA. We have a, the Canadians are wonderful people. If we have a small $15 billion deficit, that's not a problem. If Germany has the largest account surplus in the world, larger even than China in terms of financial service and the whole picture, at over $300 billion, we can do it. And then we started to look at places like Hillsdale County, or southern Fresno County. And we started to see something that was very striking. That we, I say we, it wasn't we, it were people that we wrote off as nuts that were questioning the, the post-war order, or were disruptive, or chaotic. They started to say certain things. And they said, I've come to the conclusion that under this second phase of the post-war order, we have an ossified foreign policy and military policy and strategic policy that doesn't fit this changing world, that doesn't fit the new China or the new EU, or South America didn't become all democratic. It's, because it's reverting to socialism. Or the more we reach out to Iran, it's not working. But what is happening is that anybody who has a job that involves muscular labor, and that job can be Xeroxed overseas, it will be Xeroxed overseas. And this divide is, is destroying this country culturally, socially, geographically, because we're creating two very wealthy cultures from Florida to Boston and from La Jolla to Seattle. And they're in culture, in taste, in affinity, closer in the West Coast to maybe Shanghai 
and Tokyo and the East Coast to London and Paris than they are to Hillsdale. This is, the, this is the interior culture. And these interior culture people that work assembling products are the industrial heart of America that won World War II that had a greater GDP than all the other combatants and allies together have been hollowed out because they can have their job replicated and the people on the coast can't. China can't build a Stanford University yet. Japan still hasn't figured out quite to, to match our hedge fund. As one person, I gave a talk not too long ago, and a very angry person that said, Mr. Hansen, do you wake up one morning and find somebody did your column for half the price from South Korea? I said, no, that hasn't happened yet. He said, when it will, you know how I feel. And the point was that we were starting to say that these were the deplorables, clingers, expendables. They were the losers of globalization. We went the next step and said, it wasn't just that they lost out, but they deserved to lose out. They didn't move. They took math. It was almost as if they, they developed the pathology and then the industry left rather than what really happened. The industries left and then they developed the pathologies. So this post-war order had not caught up to these new global realities. And we tried to adjust. 2009 to 2016, Barack Obama came in with a new foreign policy. And give him credit, he understood that the old George W. Bush going into Iraq or Afghanistan or Georgia, it's not the same thing anymore. But he took, he took this evidence and he came up with a very disturbing conclusion. And he said, the reason it's not working is our fault because we try to impose our will on people. And who's to say that a, a United States democratic liberal society is any better than what's in Iran? And, you know, we always bought back these Gulf monarchies in Israel, but maybe Iran should be a legitimate hegemony. And maybe we should, who were to say that we can dictate to them when they get nuclear weapons, so we'll do this Iran deal. And we gotta, the reason that we haven't had a Palestinian solution is that because we've been backing the wrong people. The Israelis are intolerant or illiberal. And it doesn't really matter that we have capitalist countries in Latin America. Maybe Venezuela or Nicaragua or Cuba has a better paradigm. And the EU is pretty good. We should be more like the EU than the EU should be like us. And he didn't address the people in the interior. He furthered that diagnosis. They deserve what they got. So now we've spent 25 minutes, and you can see what's going to end up. Somebody comes along and says he's on a stage with 16 Republican nominees. He has no military experience, and he has never served in political office and he doesn't give a blank blank about the Council on Foreign Relations. He doesn't care about NATO. He looks at this as a businessman, and he says it's a bad deal. He looks at optional wars like a reality TV show. They have, if you go into somewhere, you usually get bad ratings, and it doesn't work out on a cost-benefit analysis. So that was his idea about going into Libya, for example. And so he's not wedded to any of these things, and he starts to look at the world empirically that's changed radically from the post-war order, second phase, which is supposed to deal with it. And he add the Obama aberrance, and he starts to come up with crazy ideas. Crazy to them, maybe not so crazy to us. And he said, I like NATO. All they got to do, they're wealthy countries, the GDP of Europe and the population is greater, just pay what they promised. Don't pay as much as we do, but just pay, we pay 4% GDP into military spending, you pay two. If you don't gonna do it, we're, we're gonna leave. Well, I don't think he was gonna leave, but that was what he said. And he said to Mexico, you know what? We might have to close the border, we might have to yank out some of the factories and the trade deals, and we might have to put a tariff on products that are sent back. And people said, you can't use the word tariff, that's not part of the post-war order. And basically, Trump said, well, I don't really want to put on top. That's art of the deal. I threaten, I threaten, I threaten. And they'll back down maybe from 350 billion surplus to 2 billion. That's a victory. But nobody ever thought like that before. He was endangering the post-war order. And he looked at the world throughout, and he started to come up with a foreign policy. And they actually memorialized it in 2017. If you take looked at the strategic plan of the United States and national security, Security assessment written by H.R. McMaster and his team, it's pretty much called principled realism. 
and it is a complete rejection of 75 years of foreign policy of the United States. And it's predicated on the idea that foreign policy and domestic policy are inseparable, and there were certain shibboleths there that we should recognize for what they are. China, the wealthier it's going to be, is going to be more autocratic. The Palestinians are never going to be democratic until they, on their own, throw out their corrupt elite. And we can't help them do that anymore. And Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan are probably not going to be democratic, but they're better than the alternative in Iran. Radical Shia, you know, messianic, expansionary Islam. And Latin America is likely to be communist as capitalist, but if we have our druthers, we're going to support capitalist states and not communist. And you start to read it, you, you, it was termed Jacksonian. Don't tread on me foreign policy. And what that meant was, I think, if you read it carefully, it means we're not going to seek trouble in the world. We're not going to be the world's policemen, but we are going to deter our enemies, and we will strike back if they strike us back, and we may have to preempt once in a while, and that will make a safer world, and it might have the same effect, but we're not going to claim that every single struggle in the world is of interest to somebody in Hillsdale County, because we've seen where that leads, economically, domestically. And we're going to start be asking for, we have two doctrines of the new Jacksonianism, as I understand it. I'm not being an advocate, I'm trying to explain to you. Is one is, if what they are doing doesn't matter, why do they do it? If you think trade surpluses don't matter, then why does Germany want them? Why don't they just be like us and say, they don't matter, we'll run a deficit with you. Who cares who has the trade surplus? We'll just take the tariff on you know, American cars and we'll do the same thing as you guys have. You have 2.5% on the Audi, we'll have 2.5% in the Ford. Or if, China, if trade deficits don't matter, We'll run up a three billion dollar, three hundred billion dollar surplus, and China will have a three. And that was sort of the logic that Trump, of course, used. That was the first thing. And the second was that I'm going to calibrate foreign policy in terms of how it affects people. This was kind of scary sometime, and that would mean if we want to stay in Afghanistan, what is the effect on the people who have to go over there? What's the effect on the U.S. budget? And is it really possible to turn Afghanistan into Carmel, California, and if so, at what cost? That was the, that's in the, the principled realism. And so what made it even stranger was that once we saw this new Trump foreign policy that said, I'm looking at everything empirically. NATO is 65 years old. If it works here, I'm willing to subsidize it if you guys want to participate. NAFTA is there, but it's not written in stone. I'm willing to keep going if it's reciprocal. I'm willing to still trade with China if they get out of, if they don't, if they follow the rules in the way that we follow the rules. And everybody said, but we always took a hit. We always took a hit for the greater good. And he said, it's not the greater good, and we can't afford to take the hit. We've done it for 75 years, and we've hollowed out the interior. So that was a very powerful message that got him nominated in ways that. 16 other brilliant candidates did not see, and it's enraged the establishment in the university, and the think tanks, and the foundations, and the political bipartisan establishment. And yet he wrote it all out. It was, it's not just herky-jerky. It's written right out in an assessment that we have a new principled realism for a radically different world that doesn't look anything like our foreign policy that was formed in 1945 for a very different world. And if I could sort of summarize it in a, a, just a phrase, it's Jim Mattis gave a speech once, and I think he summarized it. It's no better friend, no worse enemy. That the world is not full of neutrals anymore, and there's not going to be a global community, and there's not going to be a utopian situation, or there's not going to be a postmodern globe where we're all climate change advocates and we all believe in gender rights and it's not going to happen. There's going to be local differences, there's going to be tribalism, there's going to be chaos all over the world as there is as I speak right now and what we're going to do is pretty much look at people that we have more than less in common with and support them. They're going to be our friends and people we feel are disruptors or don't like this American system. We're going to 
be enemies to, and that's going to make actually because we're a unique, exceptional country and we have better judgment than these global uh, organizations like the UN, that's going to make a safer world abroad. So, and it's going to have a don't tread on me act. Don't attack the United States. Don't point missiles at Portland, Oregon. Don't cheat on trade. Don't fortify the, or something might happen to you. And we're going to make that decision with the allies that we can and by ourselves if we must. Let me just finish by saying there's two other things I think are very important to understand this end of the post-war world and why this strange fellow from Manhattan real estate entrepreneur was able to craft a message that kind of fit the world as we see it rather than the world as we would like it. And yet it had dramatic electoral ramifications because he appealed to people who were the losers of globalization and resonated with. One is you would think that it wouldn't work because he would be ostracized by all the institutions that fed people into a typical Republican administration. So you see all of these notable diplomats. They have billets at the most prestigious things, and they write op-eds almost every day. He's destroying the world. Anybody who would serve in that administration should be ashamed. And yet, when you look at the four or five architects who are tasked with carrying this out, they're the finest, finest foreign policy team since we've since in World War II. You'll never find a better defense secretary than James Mattis. Mike Pompeo is a brilliant. If you look at his activity compared to a, a John Kerry or Rex Tillerson or Hillary Clinton, there's no, there's no comparison. If you look at Nikki Haley, what she's doing at the UN. If you look at John Bolton as national security advisor. These are all excellent points. How can that be? And it's because there were a lot of people in Washington who were not duly appreciated because they saw that the post-war order was not working to a vastly changed world, and when they spoke out against it, they were ostracized. Or that you had to bring people from different walks of life into that administration. And I'll end with this, just the comment. We talk about the Trump economic boom, or the Trump revolution, but I would suggest to you that what we're doing in foreign policy is far more radical and far more important because it's the only system that we can see that we've seen that has a answer or at least address things that were considered either not our business or insolvable. So we, we just look at the world new and we say, think about it, we're liberated. You cannot get out of the Iran deal, why not? He never sent it to the treaty, he never had it ratified by the Senate, we got out, it's over with. Mitt Romney would have never done that. You cannot say that the Palestinians are not refugees. Why? The Volga Germans were refugees the same year they were. Are they still called refugees? 13 million Prussians walked back, East Germans, to Germany. They were refugees. They're not anymore. Why are the Palestinians special? They're not. No more refugees. No more embassy. Jerusalem has always been the historical and iconic capital of Israel. Just move it. You can't do that. Just do it. So we did it. And on and on and on. And that's a very liberating uh, attitude, and it's starting to have much more ramifications even than the booming economy, which is part and parcel of the foreign policy. So I guess what I'm saying in conclusion is that this foreign policy, besides being principled realism and looking for allies and then accepting that people won't like us and shouldn't like us and we don't like them and they sh we shouldn't like them, it's also saying the world is back to 1946 again and we're looking at it empirically and we're trying to come up with new solutions and some of those solutions should have been done a long time ago and rather than be ra radical and revolutionary, they're way overdue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. We now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you.
Yeah. We have a question to the speaker's right. Did I understand you to say that there is an outline of rational, coherent foreign policy paper and has never been publicized, never been explained? How did that happen? I can, uh, I can assure you that if you go on to uh, Google tonight and you look at the national security assessment or national security policy, you'll see that it was released in December of 2017. It was authored by H.R. McMaster. And the term that's used the most is the word principled realism. And the theme of it is that the United States is looking at everything from a new point of view and not locked into a post-war order that no longer mirrors the situation that we have. What? Why is it that everybody doesn't know that? Well, John, John Bolton knows it, and Trump knows it, and Pompeo knows it. And that's why they're... <laughs> So that, that's why they're saying certain things that they're not supposed to be saying. They're saying North Korea cannot point missiles at Portland and San Diego and then extort us. That's not going to be a situation. And they're saying the Iranians are going to have to have spot inspections. They're not going to use that $400 billion that they're going to get in the next 20 years from this deal to subsidize terrorism. And there is no, as far as we're concerned, Palestinians are going to have to come up with their own government and deal in a bilateral, but we're not going to subsidize that project, and on and on and on. And NATO is going to have to pay. That's all in there. And it's the idea is that it hasn't been good for the people that we're dealing with to subsidize them psychologically or financially. And there's never been a, a power in history that, that subsidizes other powers that they like them for that. So if you want to know why the Europeans don't like us sometimes or they ankle bite us, it's because we subsidize their defense. And if they can become full partners with us, they'll like us more. But they won't unless they're forced to, human nature being what it is. We have a question to the speaker's left. Yeah. Uh, in terms of trade, uh, has blockchain had a major impact on the way we view our trading partners in terms of the way we um, deal with our trading partners because with blockchain we can now detect cheating on the part of the Canadians and the, the Mexicans and in terms of trans shipping things. That I, I think it has. There's been a lot of things that have changed our ideas of trade. One of them was that you remember when Barack Obama said, what is he going to do, have a ma magic wand and bring jobs back? They're gone. And he, that, I'm quoting him literally, not just figuratively. And so we said in this new way of thinking, why isn't it possible? I, you go to Europe, I go to Europe, we see people working, Americans work pretty hard. Why can't an American know how? If we can build the world's best universities and jets, why can't we have the best industrial sector? And so if it's a free, if it's a, and we have the technology, as you point out, to, to ascertain who is cheating and who's not cheating, and why would they want to cheat if cheating doesn't matter? That's what we've been told. And if cheating does matter and we're willing to sec accept it because it's for the good of the world, if, what if it isn't for the good of the world? What if we're just empowering the Chinese Navy in a way that we wouldn't if they were, had to deal a, a, according to the normal commercial protocols everybody else has to do? We had gotten in such a rut that just to suggest these things was an anathema. And the final thing is, if you think, if you try to tell Mexico, we'd, we'd like to help you, and we want to bring you up to Canada's level of prosperity, and I know that we used to think that that was by running up these huge trade surpluses, but it's really your fault. You're not transparent. You don't have an independent judiciary. You don't have property rights. You don't have truly constitutional elections. And when you do, you'll be as prosperous as Canada. But in the meantime, we're not going to subsidize it anymore. And so when you start to talk like that, what mechanisms do you have other than sober and judicious diplomats met at a summit and both said it was helpful and constructive? That's what we did. And so Trump comes along and art of the deal, you know, he uses the T word, tariff. But there is no other coercion you can use except a threat to do the unmentionable. So now he's a protectionist and all that, but what he's trying to do is act crazy 
and unstable, and then somebody on his economic team or his national security team goes, he, he bothers me more than he does you, but you guys in Europe or you guys in Japan or you guys in China, deal with us before you have to deal with him. So that's what he's doing. <laughs> He wrote about it. I mean, if you read Art of the Deal, Art of the Comeback, all those books, it's pretty transparent. The only thing I'm worried about is the enemies read those books too, and they're going to say, you know what? He's bluffing. We have a question near the center of the room. Thank you, fellow California native. I'm Walt, a legal immigrant to Cal uh, Florida. You focus on foreign policy, but do you have a view on the convention of states as a viable to amend the Constitution? Uh, well, I mean, in theory, yes, but when you get them all together, as we, we know, we don't know what's going to happen. So they're almost states are like individual voters. And so um, I know things are bad, but I can imagine they could be a lot, a lot worse. And so what protects us is the Constitution that we've had for, we're in our third century. So I, I, I don't want to do that yet. So I, I'd say no on that. But uh, maybe it's because I've seen how democracy works in California and everything that's destroyed the state is, uh, was voted on by the, the people or the legislature or it was enacted by the court. So I, I understand your frustration. but. I don't think you want to get a bunch of states together and then to, I'll just add very quickly, what's dangerous about this sectarianism, this red, blue, it's, a, it's not like the 60s where it's left, right. It's more like the 1850s because there's a geographical element that's a force multiplier. It's not just that when I go back to California, the way people talk and eat and their, the way that their, their, their lifestyles are, the hipsters, what's the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> it's not just that they're different than Michigan or Ohio, but they're the same as the coast and the, and the west and east coast. And so we're creating two cultures that are not just culturally, but they're geographically distinct. And that's what we did in the Civil War. And so when you see the Trump rallies and then you see the people who are standing up at the Kavanaugh hearings and screaming, you've got two people who live in geographically different places and they don't like each other and they don't have much in common. So it's kind of scary, very scary. We have a question up right here. Yeah. Yes, do you have any thoughts on the change in our monetary policies over the last, say, oh, pre Bretton Woods to now and what will happen in the future? I know that's a lot of topic. You mean like interest rates? That kind of thing, how we manage money, I know we'll never go back to gold standard. Uh, you know, well, how are we one gonna thing I didn't mention is that part of the second phase of the post-war order was predicated on taking serious debts and making them almost unsustainable. So George Bush almost in seven years, not quite eight, he doubled the debt. And then Barack Obama ran as a physical conservative and said, you took the Bank of China credit card, you remember that? He said, and you doubled, and then he doubled the debt, and it was all predicated on near zero interest rates. So if you look at the amount of money that we were paying when Obama left office and to service a almost $20 trillion debt, it wasn't all that much more than Bill Clinton was paying at 7% interest for a $6 trillion debt. But we got to the point where we thought, Zero interest rates was a new norm. And one of the things we're seeing with Trump is the interest rate starts to go up a little bit. It's actually helping the economy because we basically confiscated about $3 trillion over the last 20 years from people like yourself that save money and you put it in a passbook account and you got zero interest. And then people were able to borrow money very cheaply. So that's starting to end a little bit. And it's going to be very tricky because if we have this labor, six million jobs are going unfilled. We have the economies heating up. It's probably going to grow at nearly 4% GDP and inflation. And we have this big debt. And yet, there's not too many things you can do if we get into an economic crisis uh, because we've used them all. We have a big debt. We have almost low interest. What else are you going to do to stimulate the economy? So I think we've got it. Trump, at some point, if he gets reelected, is going to have to pivot 
and do some things that might be called deflationary or at least address entitlements and debt and budgetary concerns. Because the, the budget deficits are not sustainable, the Social Security system is not sustainable, and uh, to, to rectify that is pretty dramatic and it's going to cause a lot of hurt to people. But it's going to have to be done now or it will be done much more abruptly in the future. We have a question toward the back of the room. Yeah. Uh, something you mentioned brought me back to something very mundane, back to the fundamentals. As a former coach, fundamentals are very important. You mentioned the importance of the Constitution. The Constitution by our last president was considered an obsolete document. He mentioned that more, uh, more than on one, one occasion. Executive orders have been abused by many presidents. They were meant to be used within the agencies that answered to the president, have extended beyond that. And then you have the judicial branch that has taken over the executive, the congressional, and its own branch. It's, the judiciary is out of control. At this point, what can how can we look at this in a way that we can start to get back to the fundamentals? Well, it's a very good question, you see, because in some ways Donald Trump was created by Barack Obama. And by that I mean when Donald Trump has been very successful with just one big signature tax package, but what has jump-started this economy is a series of executive orders. I don't know the constitutionality of each one, but what he's done is he's deregulated, He's opened up ANWR, he's had an executive order on Keystone, he's muzzled the EPA, and he's using the executive branch in lieu of the legislative branch, and he's, he's been thwarted by the courts, so he's trying to get you know, conservative constitutional judges, but it depends on, I guess he would say, they made the rules and I'm using them now against them, but I don't know to what degree uh, Trump has violated any executive order that I know of. One of the ironies that we're in this political system, we're saying, well, Donald Trump is saying the fake news, he's hurting them, but he hasn't. He hasn't monitored the Associated Press journalist. He hasn't monitored the emails of a Fox reporter. He hasn't weaponized the IRS that go after people. He hasn't jailed a video maker. He hasn't gone into a FISA court and said, I'm not going to give you the complete story about this dossier. So in his his rhetoric is alarming, but when you actually look at it, who was alarming was a mellifluous Obama, because he took these the CIA, the DOJ, the FBI. <laughs> he, he he took all of these these deep state permanent bureaucracies, and he he really tried to affect the outcome of the 2016 election with John Brennan and and Clapper and Comey and all and McCabe. And yet, and he monitored people, and he did a lot of very radical things. He said he couldn't be a king 21 times or to the effect of that, and then he went around and did DACA and the Dreamer Act and pretty much destroyed federal immigration law. And then he said, he allowed these cities to say, and I'm living one, that's a sanctuary city. If Hillsdale tomorrow says, I'm a sanctuary city, anybody in Hillsdale township does not have to follow federal gun registration. Just go and buy a gun. Nobody's going to do it. We're a sanctuary city. Or you know what? If you see a three-spotted toad that's on the endangered, shoot the thing in the head. This is a sanctuary city. <laughs> you can imagine what California would say. But it's all one way. They can, they can nullify. And you can see where it goes. It goes back to the nullification crisis of 1826 in South Carolina in the 1850s. So we've, we've just coming off a very radical president that for some reason, his supporters now are shocked that Donald Trump, he hasn't done what, he's, what Obama did, but he sounds uh, radical. But I don't, I don't pay much attention. I don't think we should. It's what people do, not what they say. Any other questions? Question to the speaker's left. Would you mind sharing your thoughts a little bit about the coming midterm, select, um, midterm elections? Uh, maybe best case scenario and worst case scenario, and what we can do as conservatives? Well, the worst case scenario would be that some of these uh, liberal prognosis are right about the Senate, that they could take the Senate. 
and that would mean they'd have to win races like the Cruz race or something. If that would happen, uh, they would impeach him in the House, and then we would have an acrimonious impeachment in the Senate with a lot of pressure on moderate Ben Sass like Republicans to join what would be a majority already to get 60 votes. And that would pretty much stall or destroy the Trump agenda. That would be the worst case scenario. I don't think they would impeach him, but it would be long and drawn out, much more than the Clinton impeachment. The best case scenario is that we usually lose, I think it's 27 seats in a um, midterm election the first year that Trump somehow would, would buck historical trends, he'd lose four or five seats in a House. He'd retain the House, he'd retain the Senate, and that would be seen as a devastating setback to this, what we saw at the Kavanaugh hearing or the anonymous op-ed or the Woodward Brook, that whole cycle of delegitimizing the president. So which is which? It just depends on two things, and I don't have the answer to it. Nobody seems to, and that is how, how uh, in a midterm election, how mobilized are the Trump base? In other words, when they see the Kavanaugh hearings or they read about the New York Times or they say, that's terrible, but it's a midterm, or they say, that's so terrible, I'm going to go out and vote for my candidate. And then we don't know the effect of all these things on the independent so-called voter. We, we found out in 2016 that, just think for a minute, in 2016, the night of the election, the New York Times published three polls, and they said a ver there's 1 percent chance that Trump can win, there's 9 percent chance, and there's 16 percent. And we're not even going to mention Nate Sol uh, Silver. He's so pessimistic. He's giving Trump 27 percent chance of winning. That's where we were. So we're hearing this. It's kind of eerie. We're hearing the same thing about the midterm. Blue wave, Trump is, people get sick of him, but we don't know whether that same that same phenomenon is there. It seems to me that I don't, when I see people and they're for Trump, they don't want to talk about it. When they're not for Trump, they yell about it because they understand the social consequences of each. And if that is still true, then I think he's being underreported by two or three percent and the people who support him are. But we're going to have to wait to the midterm. Any final questions? I don't know how we are in time. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Uh, I've heard you talk about Athenian society and the quieting that took place there when a good chunk of its people became dissatisfied with the culture that did not represent them. Do you think we have that going on now? And essentially, how do we get back to being friends with each other? Yeah. Well, you're speaking to someone that grew up with three siblings and two first cousins that were part of my family. And of my four siblings, if, is this going to be aired? I guess it might be on tape. <laughs> two of them voted for, uh, I, I suppose, Bernie Sanders, and two voted for Hillary Clinton. So, and they, they, made, me, they made me aware of it. But, <laughs> and uh, so what we want to do is when we see people who vote differently than we do, we don't want to make that the sole criteria of how we treat each other. We can say there's all different factors that lead to that wrong decision on their part. But, <laughs> but and, and we don't want to hold a grudge. We don't want to hold a grudge. So what I, I try to do is, if I have to give a lecture and somebody disrupts it or somebody yells or I, I get, I mean, I, I live in California and I work at Stanford, so I'm in a situation where nine out of 10 people don't agree with me and one or two will come up and tell you that. So you want to not take it seriously. You don't want to have a vendetta. You don't want to warp your soul. And that's what would happen. You don't want to end up hating. And yet, you don't want to be a pacifist either. You have to be firm, and you, because if you're not firm, you don't help the cause. You don't help the people that trust as you do. But you don't want to end up hating somebody or, or despising somebody. You, so I try to look for the good part in everybody. I hope they treat me the same. I do think, though, that I'll just end with this comment. There's something about the current left, the progressive left, that's holistic in a way that the right isn't. By that I mean people who are conservative, they're willing to put politics in a central part of their life, but they have spheres 
uh, subordinate spheres that are not contaminated by politics. You don't really care what the politics of a football player are. You would like to see the Oscars or the Emmys just to, to give the, the you don't want to hear a, a lecture at the Miss America contest. You want to turn on late night comedy and not be lectured. But the left feels that because their goals are so noble of radical egalitarianism, that it justifies any means necessary. And that means that the universities, uh, entertainment, Hollywood, every aspect of our lives in a very Orwellian way has to be politicized and weaponized. And that's what we're all upset about. We, we don't want a war, we just want to say, or a discord, we just want to say, give us some peace. So out, once we get out of the political realm and we go to a football game or turn on music or watch a TV show, we don't have that 24-7 indoctrination. And for them, they can't do that because they feel they're morally superior and they're a war and me, any means are justified because of their noble goals. That's the difference between us. Thank you.